Hi everybody, so I'm, I'm Dan, oh hello Gil, yeah. I'm Daniel from Modulus. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Ron from Modulus. <laughs> Excellent, and we're here to talk about uh, something that Gil heard like literally three days ago, sorry. Um, this is like a very sexy title so you don't fall asleep. Uh, really it's the subtitle that matters and we'll go into what all of that means in just a moment. But uh, maybe a good place to start is, um, uh, is a personal anecdote and this is a real story. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, I went to my general practitioner, right, uh, for my annual physical, which is important because I, I value my health. Uh, and uh, let's call her Dr. Chung. You know, Dr. Chung and I, we banter as we normally do. I'm a big fan of hers. I might have a small crush on her. Um, and, you know, as always, she, she always tells me the same thing. Dan, don't, don't call me Dr. Chung. Call me Joyce, let's say. Um, and, you know, I'm like, that's cute. Uh, uh, whatever, whatever. We go through our thing. Uh, but she keeps saying this, right? And, and uh, at some point, I realized that she's actually uh, uh, not a doctor. Like, she's saying this not to be cute. She's saying this because she's genuinely not certified as a doctor. She didn't even go to medical school. She's a nurse practitioner, which is awesome as well. Uh, but obviously, my crush one way, the power dynamic, all that is gone. Uh, it was very devastating to me. Uh, but it did help us, you know, Ryan's kind of my therapist, uh, realize that what I think, what we think will be the defining trend of really the era that we're kind of stepping into. Uh, so this is a very scientific graph of the number of doctors over time. Uh, a lot of dramatic reveal. TLDR, we think that, you know, we're going to hit some kind of maxima and then it's going to decline, right? And we don't think that this is, or we think it's not just going to be doctors. It'll also be, you know, lawyers and teachers and, and consultants and so forth, right? In fact, the reason that Dr. Chung is not a doctor and a nurse practitioner and still in that role is because, at least in California, we are not able to supply enough doctors into that role, right? So, so there's already a deficit. Uh, which makes this kind of an odd curve, right? And if you remember the first slide, it won't be too surprising what we're talking about, right? It's AGI, right? Which just to define our terms, uh, to us means just really any algorithm that is uh, just as good, if not better, than a human being at a specific role, right? Uh, hopefully across a general uh, range of tasks, but nonetheless, you know, a, uh, a model that is like a doctor, uh, but, you know, maybe a lot cheaper, importantly. Yeah, that's really key. Right, and so this is, uh, this is kind of what motivates, I think, a lot of the thinking that we do at Modulus uh, in terms of what's coming next, right? Because of course, uh, it doesn't take a lot, if you buy into that premise, for us to you know, encounter a situation like this, right? Uh, this is kind of a somber message, but maybe one that, that uh, you know, uh, is not so uh, far-fetched anymore, uh, thanks to all the stuff that's been happening recently with these language models, right? I'm afraid you have cancer. Um, for just a moment, I'm curious if folks here, upon receiving something like this from your GPD interface, right, your, your, your annual physical, uh, would say, you know, start treatment, right? Uh, if you can just raise your hand if you think you actually would start chemo upon seeing that. Okay, there's a couple people. That's yeah, actually nice. pretty good. That is pretty good. Yeah, normally we do this at Stanford and we get like one person. Yeah. Uh, um, that's kind of weird, right? Because, you know, as we mentioned before, these models are supposed to be uh, quite good at what they're, you know, meant to do, right? Uh, we, we trust Sam. We think OpenAI will do a great job uh, in the medical regime. Uh, folks will fine-tune these models. Uh, I think, you know, it's worth thinking, what, what is the difference? Why is it that for the vast majority of us, we kind of hit pause and go, uh, maybe we don't want to just take this model at, at face value? Um, yeah. Actually, could I have folks raise their hands and give a couple reasons that they might be uncomfortable with the idea of starting chemo, given that GPT-5 doctor just told you this? Yeah. I think it's pretty bad at answering even just reasonable, like advanced undergrad math problems mm -hmm. or grad level, just completely bullshits. Um, yep. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hallucinations are a huge issue, and it doesn't cite sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they kind of reason or even plan. Yeah. That's very fair. Yeah, there's no kind of semblance of like logical reasoning or kind of like the notion of like basically like what is the underlying mechanism behind like a diagnosis, for example, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not familiar with like the historical track record of the accessory. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, as in for modern doctors, right, we have basically like the fact that they have their medical license implies that they haven't been sued for malpractice like out of business yet, right? Um, which means they must have been doing okay. Um, okay, so these are. Awesome, awesome examples. I just wanted to, I guess, like get basic ideas from the audience. 
and they basically match exactly what we think, right? So one of the question, one of the key questions we have is, like uh, basically Daniel's, uh, like Joyce person, is GPT-5 doctor even a certified medical doctor? We have no idea, no one knows. And the second thing is, does GPT-5 doctor have a clean track record, right? Is it actually effective, not just on the MCAT, for example, not just on the step two, but actually in diagnosing and like on the job? So these are the questions that we kind of have. And the point is that in general, AI is what we like to call unknowable. So in other words, you don't know that it's certified and it's unaccountable. In other words, even if it is certified somehow on the job, you can't actually kind of like blame it, right? You can't sue it for malpractice. You can't trace its results basically back to a specific model. And we think this is a huge problem if AI is going to be deployed at scale in these critical environments. So what's missing? Well, it's exactly these things, right? It's the certification and it is the track record. Um, and the idea here is that, similarly as to what Dan was saying earlier, it doesn't just have to be GPT-5 doctor. It can also be GPT-5 lawyer, for example, or GPT-5 teacher, so on and so forth. And I guess the point is that these two things form kind of the crux of what we think about when we think about basically AI trust and safety going into the future, right? If we actually want to use these models responsibly and kind of like use them for all the powers that they give us, we really need these things. Um, so there will be a couple slides. Yeah, like we generally have these for humans. Why don't we have them for AI, right? <clears throat> cool. So here's kind of like the AI seesaw, some buzzwords. Um, basically, AI is trained on kind of like valuable or sensible IP, uh, is very, very computationally expensive, which we'll factor in a little bit. And on the other hand, we need certification and we need a track record for these things. The, uh, the TLDR is like, this, this problem will be solved, right? Just because, like, again, these models will be cheaper than human beings. Uh, uh, it will be more effective oftentimes than human beings. Uh, and so, the way it's going to be solved is we're just going to see central solutions come in, um, and they're going to be awesome, right? Uh, yeah, please. You know, it's already starting, right? We're we're going to hire Scale AI to come in and look at models for you know defense purposes. We're going to start up you know new policy think tanks and new uh, uh, task forces to come up with interesting policies around uh, you know uh, uh, regulating the number of flops that go into training a model, where the kind of silica that's available for specific types of, uh, of training, which is awesome, right? So here's the Service provider, here's us. We're just going to put you know, something in the middle there. Right? That's the central authority that intermediates uh, these two parties. And of course, we're going to make that nice and red, because red is a healthy, positive color that we're really excited about. Um, so excited. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, before we move on, uh, just between us, don't let the VCs know. But that's probably what's going to happen. Right? In fact, it's already started to happen. Uh, trust seems to work just fine for most of society. Uh, for the past thousands of years, at least between human beings, it seems like this model could work for AI models as well. Um, but at least in Modulus, we think there's actually a precious and small window where maybe we can take a different path, right? And of course, this is going to be familiar to a lot of you all, so we'll maybe blitz through this section very quickly. Uh, in a parallel galaxy, we have zero-knowledge proofs. We have a specific application of this technique called zero-knowledge machine learning. Um, we can go through this quickly. Yeah, zero-knowledge proofs. You know, y'all can read about the history of that. Um, oh, this is kind of a neat idea. We think the, the, the actual like, poly commit right, that we make of specific AI models is a really underappreciated primitive. Right? So this is a potentially privacy-preserving representation of a specific AI model. Right? And so if you have, say, a register um, or a registry of all these different commitments, you basically have like, an identity protocol or an identity network of AI models. Oh yeah, and this is the specific statement that the ZKP is making in this case, right? This model did exactly this thing and got this result. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to basically the difference between ZKML and traditional ZKPs, uh, we kind of like to think of it this way, and I guess I would actually challenge you all to think about it this way. So traditionally, ZK basically says, here is some computation that I want to do. I have some inputs which are hidden, I have some inputs which are public, and I'm going to get this either hidden or public output, right? And the proof basically shows that the output is correctly computed from the input. In the case of ZKML, on the other hand, I would actually like you all to think about the polynomial commitment rather than the ZK snark or the ZK proof as the, my, uh, as the main primitive, right? The idea here is that a polynomial commitment, similar to a hash function, but with other kind of nice properties, kind of hides a model, but also binds a model in the sense that if you change a single model weight, your entire PCS is going to fall apart and your verification is not going to work. So with this idea, 
You can basically think of a polynomial commitment to a model as a kind of model resume, where you can just like start layering statements on top of this model commitment. So for example, this particular commitment is to, let's say, GPT-5 medical. And some statements that you can make about it are, hey, the AMA conducted the MCAT on this model, and it verifiably got an MCAT score of 522. Um, also, it got a step uh, two score of 260. I had to look this up. It's pretty good, I think. Um, and finally, for example, that its track record is really good. Out of the past 1310 ontology diagnoses it, uh, it did, it got 1260 of them right. So when it tells me I have cancer, I should probably believe it. Um, and finally, there is the actual statement that it's actually making, and you can show that this statement comes from that model via the model commitment. So the key insight here is that the commitment to the model, or the polynomial commitment, is the thing which is really important. And the best part is, of course, you can verify all these statements. You don't need a centralized third party to do this. <clears throat> uh, so this idea is what we actually like to call basically commitments with qualia. So in other words, the commitment is, of course, the commitment to the model parameters themselves. And the qualia are all the statements that you can basically layer on top of it, which make it actually trustworthy. Um, and so for example, I guess, oh yeah, and that's the definition. Yeah, uh, they're mathematically verifiable, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I guess the uh, point is that some examples that you might think about in AI land is, hey, this model achieves great accuracy on this validation set. This model is unbiased. This model doesn't work, um, or basically this model is not susceptible to adversarial attacks, things like that. <clears throat> Um, and the TLDR is that, as opposed to kind of the unknowable, unaccountable AI that we had previously, ZKML can really help us endow AI with certification on all these tests, as well as a track record based on all the stuff that the model is doing, but it's all verified. And so it goes from unknowable and unaccountable to knowable and accountable. Yeah, I, you know, this, this, this part we, we, we can all agree on. We're going to knock out that, we're going to put the calculator there. And the goal, of course, is eventually for all this to be abstracted away, that really kind of uh, making this polynomial commitment, this ZKP uh, kind of uh, ecosystem is just uh, the expectation for the production environment, right? So you always get trusted or rather trustless, you know, uh, uh, queries, trustless results uh, and known models. Yeah, so obviously, you know, if this is the two potential futures, we know which one we're excited about. Um, which begs the question, uh, you know, are we there yet? Right. And we are really excited to be here to tell you that we are uh, not quite there yet, no, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but we are getting closer, which is very exciting. Um, so this is a graph that you won't see too often. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's not very scientific, but this is approximately the absolute overhead for ZK, uh, but specifically as applied to machine learning operations, right? So if you take one of these really fancy ZKVMs that people keep talking about, um, you know, which is designed primarily for generic uh, operations, right? I want to emulate uh, a VM, right? Uh, uh, it could be Cairo, it could be Jolt, it could be SP1. Uh, the overhead regime, although it's getting better, is about 300,000 X, right? So for a dollar worth of AI results, uh, it took, you know, or it would take $300,000 to prove that that $1 was done correctly, uh, which is a little eye-watering in that context, but this has gotten a lot better. Like it used to be so much worse. And actually, at this regime, we can already build uh, kind of some early prototypes. So these are things that we've built in the past year. We built a toy AI trading bot. This was the first ever ZKML project in the history of the world. Um, it lost all of its money. Of course it did. Uh, but you know, uh, it's a cute, cute, cute attempt. Uh, we built uh, AI games, right? All verifiable again. And of course, we even built a, a generative art engine, right? Also an AI model that is verifiably kind of authentic. So a few months ago, we announced uh, our own specialized prover. So as opposed to a ZK prover that's dedicated to generic operations, this thing only supports machine learning uh, operations. And if you all have questions about why that's an important kind of paradigm shift, we're happy to talk more about it kind of uh, you know, offline. Um, but the approximate overhead is around 200x, right? So this is already significantly better uh, than you know, what was previously available. And of course, at this regime, um, you know, we're, we're working with WorldCoin, for example, on a, a privacy-preserving kind of a, a, a iris uh, authentication uh, on the user's phone, right? So on the edge device. So uh, that data never gets sent to a centralized server anywhere. Um, you know, you throw your phone in the river, so goes your data. That's great. Uh, Alora, not Upshot, sorry, apologies. Uh, Alora has this really excellent NFT appraisal uh, model, right? Uh, so actually verify, uh, verifying the consistency of that, showing that the prices cannot be tampered with, can't be nudged as though the prices came natively from the chain. Uh, that's something that's available at this regime. And of course, uh, we just started working with a protocol called ION, uh, which is uh, you know, trying to create this model that estimates the risk of slashing across all 400,000x 
or 400,000 plus rather uh, validators uh, on Ethereum. Um, so verifying that that, again, uh, insurance-like engine is always consistent and fair. And we think Holy Grail is there. You know, it's about 10x, right? Um, and we think we're actually pretty close, uh, which we'll talk about maybe on a different talk. Um, the reason 10x is just a fun number for us to think about uh, is because let's just take like Llama 7B as an example, right? On uh, an M1 Mac, on CPU anyways, it's about 100 milliseconds uh, per token output. And so, you know, at the 10x regime, we're seeing like one verifiable token per second um, at scale. And really, we think this is where this whole idea around commitments with Qualia begins to scale. And we see this ecosystem of verifiable apps kind of really take off. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's us. That's uh, commitments with Qualia. And uh, yeah, we think it's, uh, it's a small idea, but maybe one that will save the world, which is pretty exciting. Um, and we'd be very happy to take your questions. Thank you.